long day. <laughs> long day, but we're going to have a good time. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Well, why don't we get started? We have about an hour. We're just going to spend okay. together. Um, okay. So welcome, everyone, and welcome, Morgan Jerkins, uh, to this event to celebrate uh, the release of your latest book called Baby. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to spend, as I say, about an hour. Morgan's going to do some reading. Um, but first, let me offer a, an introduction to Morgan, who is uh, an introduction to myself, and then also Morgan. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Scott Korb. I'm the director of the MFA and writing program at Pacific University. And uh, Morgan Jerkins is a uh, member of our nonfiction faculty teaching this semester, and we are very happy uh, that you can be here. Morgan is a New York Times bestselling author of This Will Be My Undoing, which is featured here, <laughs> Living at the Intersection of Black, Female, and Feminist in White America, which was long listed for the Penn Diamondstein Spiegelvogel Award for the Art of the Essay and the Barnes and Noble Discover Pick. And also Wandering in Strange Lands, which I, which I do not have featured on my bookshelf here today. Uh, a daughter of the Great Migration reclaims her roots. And her third book, as I say, Call Baby, a novel, is what we're here to celebrate and which was released earlier this month in April. Recently, Morgan left a senior editorship at Zora Magazine, where if you haven't followed her work there, you can go and dig up all the archives. Um, and she's taken up as ESPN's The Undefeated Senior Editor for Culture. Uh, Morgan is leading a team there focused on long and short-term features on African-American music, theater, film, and fashion, as well as some other forms of entertainment. And I want to say congratulations, um, Morgan, on that new position. Do you want to start just by saying a, a thing or two about that new position and, and how it's going? Yeah, the position is going really well. It's funny because a lot of people ask me like, oh, what do you know about sports? And I'm like, not as much as you think. <laughs> um, so I'm working on just all the other intersections of culture and it's been really good. It's Perfect. been good. Mm -hmm. Great, great. So before you do um, some reading from the book, which I'd like for mm -hmm. you to start with, okay. can you talk with us a little about the story that you've composed and called Baby without ruining anything, say, and give oh, us yes. a sense <laughs> of the who and the where and the what um, okay. to ground the conversation for us? Right. Okay. So I'll start off by saying that I'm, I'm working out of a folkloric tradition with Call Baby. So um, a call is basically when a child is born inside of the amniotic sac. Um, and if you get queasy, do not Google image it. Um, but if any of you have, have you know, seen a birth before, I think you would know what I'm talking about. But um, in African-American tradition, it's believed that if you're born with a call or if you're born with a veil, as some black people say, um, you have a gift. Um, the gift to protect and heal, sometimes the gift of second sight, which means that you can either see in the past, you can see in the future or both. And so, Basically, what I did with this book is that I wanted to think about protection and healing. And I thought a lot about Black women. Black women has always been at the center of my professional writing career, particularly with This Will Be My Doing, which is how my book writing career started. And I, I thought about it and I was thinking about all these ideas about gentrification, for example, because the story is based in Harlem, thinking about capitalism um, and, and the legacy of Black women's bodies being used um, in this country and obviously around the world. And what I did was I created this um, call bearing family, if you will, of women who sell pieces of their call to the highest bidder and how this type of enterprise puts them at odds with their rapidly transforming community in a gentrifying Harlem because they're, most of their patrons are wealthy white people. So it definitely puts them at odds with that. And what's going on in this book is it takes place right in the center of conflict where they take in an abandoned child who has a call bearing, who is a call bearer herself. What they don't realize is that th that child's biological mother um, has a vendetta against them because of the way that they have sort of neglected the family in the past. So this story shows the trajectory of these two families um, and how they're, you know, they weave in and out of each other's lives. Right, right. That, <clears throat> that's a wonderful setup. Um, <clears throat> and Morgan, would you mind just spending some time reading from the book so we have a, uh, you can hear what it sounds like in our, in our head. Absolutely. So Take I'm going to read from the sixth chapter and I'm going to read about, um, Mama. Mama is the matriarch of the Melanson, the, the family, the call bearing family. Um, and I want to just uh, write about, um, well, I want to read this part where I'm talking about the brownstone in which they all live. They're desperate to maintain their foothold in this brownstone in Harlem, because as I mentioned earlier, it's rapidly gentrifying. So everyone's being displaced. There were cracks on all four corners of Mama's bedroom and they were hungry. 
black, jagged, and deep. They resembled outstretched hands whose claws leaned toward the center, anticipating when they could devour her whole. They were my mom's biggest nuisance. Over the years, she'd squandered thousands to get them painted over, but there was no polymer in the world that could overpower a vengeful spirit. She knew their brownstone was askew ever since Iris, her daughter, had been born. Cups stained in the cupboard minutes after they had been washed. Subtle sounds like fingernails scraping against windows or sharp winds on the inside persisted. But ever since Iris's premonition about that woman, Layla, the outside pre presences became more apparent. The holes in the ceiling grew larger. The wallpaper chipped and crusted no matter how many times it was patched over. And the aroma in certain rooms was stale and dead, even if perfumed oil and glass decanters was used to diffuse the smell. She didn't want to believe it. The house had been lived in for decades. Wear and tear was natural, but Mama was getting older. She had to move from her master bedroom down to the office on the first floor because her legs were no match for the stairs in her old age. Though the call nevertheless protected her body, it did not protect the mind in the same way. She had always been perceptive, paranoid even, which is why she took Iris's words to heart. But now she wondered if taking heed to that premonition about Layla's unborn child wasn't enough. The Melanson family were accustomed to precarious living situations. Before migrating, they lived along the Cane River in Natchitoches, Louisiana. Each family owned a home on Ayers property from the river to the back swamp. The ranch in which Mama resided was on land between the river and an artificial levee, the living room itself right along the central waterway, a risk for whenever there were high tides and hurricanes. Cochon de Lay characterized many weekends, night long carrying on and feasting on roast suckling pig before Sunday mass at St. Augustine. When call bears lived peacefully, they distilled oil from their camphor trees and sold them as medicine and perfume as a side hustle to everyone from the neighbors to the priests. Ever since Hala was born, Mama had been reminiscing about simpler days spent raising chickens and hogs or watching the sun touch the valley's horizon through the sand hills. She felt secure, her family was secure, their legacy intact. Hala regenerated call more quickly than anyone Mama had ever seen. She was the future the successor. For the first years of Hollow's life, my mom fantasized without worry. She would sink deep into her mattress and recall the smell of the sycamore azalea. How as a child, unlike her relatives, she was endowed with an apprehension about her sense of place while living on a seemingly congenial pocket of space where the land and water met. Moving to Harlem had brought its challenges. The camellia red beans, white lily flour, Creole seasoning, and Louisiana hot sauce did not cook so richly here. In the summertime, the scent of fried chicken wafted through the air. Then in the colder months, the air smelled of nothing but rain. They substituted their gardens for flower pots, lawns for stoops, camphor oil for their bodies. But at least they owned their brownstone outright. She and her husband, Alexander, had pulled their resources together. What she made selling her call and what he made as a blacksmith to move up north and start anew. Of course, the city lights had been too much temptation for him. Just like a man, Mama often told herself when she caught herself missing him. He had no interest in being a blacksmith anymore or hearing about how Mama was progressing with the call bearing business. Whatever earnings they cultivated, he squandered on drinking and gambling until finally Mama caught him laid up with a cabaret singer. She kicked him and his belongings out on Frederick Douglass Boulevard and he left without so much as a request for reconciliation, let alone an apology. The only thing she could remember him by was a small wrinkled photo of him that she kept on her desk and had never thought to remove after all these years. Since Alexander left her with two small children, my mom poured everything she could back into their home, devoting painstaking effort to making sure every corner was dusted and every surface polished. The home, like her business and her children, was her world, and she was hell-bent on preserving her world bounded within these four walls. A crack here or there wasn't going to change that. At least that was what she told herself. But the cracks alongside the creaking floorboards and the shoddy lighting made her feel like a visitor in her own home for years. Mama stared at the cracks and wondered if or when they would part the house in half. Her fear was now mitigated by the fact that Hollow was here. She was growing wonderfully year after year. A successor was now in place. My mom could pass on if she wanted. She was already in her late 70s and she had seen and heard enough, but she still didn't feel as confident as she wanted to with Josephine, her daughter. 
My mom should have known from birth that Josephine would never leave her side, sometimes to a fault. In the womb, Josephine relentlessly kicked my mom in the ribs whenever she ran errands. And if my mom could pull away from her, as, my, as if my mom could pull away from her. When Josephine was a toddler, after she had weaned, my mom would fall asleep often and find that Josephine had unbuttoned her blouse and was sucking from her breast. What startled my mom most was that Josephine did not cry or unlatch when she knew that she was being watched. She sucked more vis vigorously until so my mom pulled her away, massaging her red-shaped nipple and then banishing Josephine to her room. Josephine never gave her any trouble besides not being able to produce a call-bearing child. She was always eager to please, sycophantically, and annoyingly so. But as Josephine got older, Mama noticed the strength inside of her too. Mama would never admit it to her daughter, but she was worried and damn near convinced that Josephine was going to walk out that front door years ago. When Hala was born and Josephine became her mother, there was a ferocity to her disposition that Mama had never seen before, and she liked it. In her innermost private thoughts, my mom wondered when and where Josephine would test her again. My mom ran her finger along, along her own bare skin. Most of her call had already been carved and sold. Fantasies of what would it be like to rip these last few parts off and inevitably welcome death became more frequent and disruptive, appearing in and out of the back door of her mind during the most trivial of activities. She was just tired in all essence of the word, but that still wouldn't relieve her what to do with these cracks. When the sun came up in the morning, there was another thing to be fixed in the house. The damp moisture in the air spoiled the stone on the exterior. There were the costs to clean, patch, and replace the stone, stoop upkeep, repairing a ceiling leak after Helena forgot to stop a bathtub from overflowing. The cast iron work needed updating, another several thousand dollars. The constant hemorrhaging of money concerned the repairman. They asked why Mama kept repairing the house when all the money going into it could be used for another home. With the rising property taxes, where else could she go in Harlem? She refused to be displaced to Inwood, much less Washington Heights. But Mama and the rotating repairman knew that it was only a matter of time before the house would cave in. The foundation was rotten, the cracks too wide, the roots too deep. Morgan, thank you for that. Thank um, you. Wish we, wish we were in person so we could all see each other and then applaud. Um, thank you. So I have, I have a bunch of questions that I'd like to ask you about this. Um, and as we get closer to sort of 6.15 in the Pacific and 9.15 uh, mm -hmm. in the East, mm -hmm. I'll turn it to the audience for some Q&A from mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. But the passage you read, I mean, we didn't talk about what kind of questions I was going to ask. And maybe the, the passage you read um, speaks to the questions that I have in mind, mm -hmm. in part because that, that moment feels, it feels so... Um, like it feels like it contains so much of the novel all within that one passage. Oh, wow. Okay. Can, you just, can you just speak to the sort of, the, the, the sort of way in which that passage um, sort of like shoots out in all these different directions? Oh yeah. Like well, it, it reflects it's all the concerns of the book. Right, well, the interesting thing is as I was reading, I was like, whoa, this does encapsulate a lot. <laughs> um, so what I will say is, is that, um, man, where do I even start? Um, I am so invested in familial dynamics, right? And I really wanted to center these women as much as possible, but I also wanted to understand the desperation of what they do to themselves and to each other. And the thing about Mama is, as I've read from um, the chapter, she's kind of dealing with trauma from displacement already. She's already been displaced from her community in Louisiana. She's, her husband has abandoned her. And because of that, she is desperate, paranoid even, as I wrote in, in that excerpt, um, to hold on to her family and the brownstone and the business. But, um, but the brownstone is literally falling apart. But she's adamant on staying there. One of the reasons why she's adamant on staying there is because Harlem is her home. And she understands that everyone else around, around her, their time is limited. But she also understands that, you know, her family is maturing as well. She's not going to be at the head anymore. And what does that mean for her life? You know, because her life is so much built around this identity of what she can sell literally to other people. So I read that section because I wanted people to understand um, the interior lives of Black women, the stuff that they don't often say, um, and also just to... Um, make sure I complicate my mom because she can definitely, I can see why some people might look at her as a villain because of what she subjects her 
children and her grandchildren too. But I also want them to understand the undercurrents as to why she acts this way. Because she feels like because they, they, they because they all car burns, they're special. But this gift comes with a curse. Um, and it's that isolation that I wanted um, you all to be able to sense as I read that passage. And as you talk about, you know, the, the, the phrase, the innermost private thoughts of these people, and you're talking about the, the, the significance of family dynamics to you in, in your work and in this work in particular, mm -hmm. one thing that I kept noting as I was reading was that I was, I would feel an affinity for this character over here because I got into her internal private thoughts. And then I was sort of pulled in the other direction and I had this affinity for this other character who was at odds with the person we were just talking yeah, with, right? Right, and right. So, and so that phrase of like, you know, you might think of, of Mama as a villain had me thinking of the sort of old cliche that says every villain is a hero in her own story, right? Oh, wow, I never heard that. And oh, so if, wow, that, if that's that. true, that. then, then I, that was for me what was explaining the sort of the, the sort of movement back and forth in affinities I had for this character or that character, because mm -hmm. as this person's having her innermost thoughts, I, I have to be drawn to that. And then yep. if this person's having her innermost thoughts about that person, I have to be drawn this way. Right. So can you talk with me? About, because that's also, I imagine, the process of, uh, it could be a process of writing, that you mm -hmm. write deeply into the innermost thoughts of this character, but then you have to flip it around and do the innermost thoughts of the character who's at odds with that person. So mm -hmm. as you were writing, what was the experience of sort of your own shifting affinities from one person to another? Um, if, if you take my meaning. There are a couple, I'm gonna try to do it from multiple threads um, if you bear yeah. with me. So one of the things that I'll say is that I don't know why I'm this way, but my, my friends have always said to me, Morgan, you give grace to so many people. Um, most of my friends, they have shorter fuses when it comes to people and their bad decision-making. And my friends used to always say, you know, you give grace to so many people. And in turn, I give grace to them. So I used to always be seen as like the sage in my group because people will always come to me for advice because I would always want to pivot and be like, okay, well consider this narrative. It doesn't mean it's right, but it does mean that multiple truths can exist at the same time. So that's one part of it is that I try to give grace to other people because I always, my mother has always told me, you just don't know what people are going through. That's not to say that you should absolve them, but it's just saying to keep in mind that there's other things going on that could propel someone to act away with you that you don't like. The second school of thought that I'll, that I'll say is um, I am inspired by um, this late artist. Her name is Kathleen Collins. She was a multi-hyphenate um, author, playwright, director, and um, she died at the in her mid forties from cancer, and she's now getting a wonderful um, afterlife in the literary space. So whatever happened to interracial love, and also there's a collected of uh, a book of collections of her plays and scripts and letters and all that you can if you can uh, purchase right now. Um, and she did a mass a, a lecture at Howard University in the eighties, um, and what she said was in America, right. Even though we're a democracy, we're also a theocracy because so much of what we think about the laws and what considered morality is based on Christianity. Well, when it comes to black people in this country, we either could be the saint or the sinner, right? We oftentimes pit as the sinner, which is why people in this day, day and age justify our deaths all the time, or the sinner because this is what slave masters used to say we were, and that's why they had to colonize us. Or you have to be 100% good because in the history of America, black people couldn't just be normal. And so for me, that inspired me because it's like, these women are normal. They have this gift, but they're normal because they're messy because that's what life is. And so I am committed to the work of destroying that binary between the saint and the center for black female characters. The third school of thought that I would say is like, I'm inspired by villains. Like I love Tony Soprano. I love Michael Carleone. And the reason why I like these two characters is because they've done some heinous things and we've seen them do heinous things in The Sopranos and The Godfather respectively. But if you look at what drove them to these points, you know, an abusive mother, right? Um, the death of, a, the, the, the unforeseen death of, of, of a newlywed wife, right? Um, loss, grief you know, the, the burden of responsibility, then you start to see them as human. You don't have to like them, but you start to see why they do the things they do. So for all of these three, these three separate threads, 
it, it wasn't hard for me to make my mom the villain, but also understand her backstory, for me to make Josephine, you know, you dislike the reason why she's so under her mother, but understand why, because she's so desperate to please. And haven't we been so desperate to please at one point in our life? So it really wasn't hard. I wanted the readers to be like, God, I can't stand this person, but I still empathize with them. Did any of your characters surprise you as you were sort of digging into them and you found something you weren't expecting, say a mama or Josephine or Iris maybe? Yes, yeah, so I will say the character that surprised me the most, um, her name is Helena. And mm -hmm. Helena was supposed to be the successor of the Mendelssohn family, but she suffered um, a really bad accident to where she cannot regenerate Paul anymore. And um, I'm not gonna spoil what, what the reasons for that and what all happened with the accident, but what surprised me about her character is I thought she was gonna be more static. I thought that she was just gonna be this traumatized, bitter person growing up as being the outlier. And what she realizes is that despite this accident, um, painting her for years, stretching from childhood to adulthood, she has a freedom that none of them will ever experience because she's not being monetized. She's not being, her body is not being commodified anymore. So once I started to realize, and it's interesting because I used to be the kind of writer where um, I used to have um, like outlines for every chapter. It has to be this, 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 and that happening. And I remember when I was um, doing my MFA to Bennington, um, there was a, a, a poet, I think her name is Mary Lowe, I think if I'm pronouncing her name correctly, but she said about existing in the state of unknowing or not knowing, where you don't know where the story is gonna lead um, and you just keep writing. And when I started writing Helena as an adult and thinking about you know where she's going, I was like, you know what? Like she's actually free in a sense. Um, and it was pretty fun writing her. That's awesome. Um, and then, again, not to ruin anything, but but her narrative takes over so much of the, the last third of the book, really. I mean, she becomes such a, a key figure in guiding these, and really in guiding the book to the end. I mean, that's she's in a really, really important um, central figure. And that sounds like there was a discovery in there, that, that you saw that she could be that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was like when I wrote, when I started writing, I was like, you know what? Like, maybe she she finds some type of healing or maybe some type of resolution moving forward okay now i'm i'm, I'm hurt in a way because others are but how am i moving forward with that mm -hmm. so you just talked about your studying at bennington and i wanted to to get to a moment in the acknowledgments of the book mm -hmm. um where you thank novelist essayist alexander chi for as you say insisting that this initial short story be made into a novel and then you joke something about like does he ever would that would this person ever steer me wrong you know and i think mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. true about it. Mm -hmm. can you talk with us a little about this germ of the novel that was the story and what yeah. work involved to take something that's so that you know by nature is so compressed mm -hmm. you know and intricate and really expanding it out in this way and if you can think more too as you're sort of answering that question what role a mentor like Alexander Chi had and sort of guiding it, guiding you towards something totally new. Right, so the thing is I'll say is if any of you know Alexander Chi is even, even minimally, he is one of the best literary citizens out there. So many people have been, have been um, they have been mentored by him. Um, they have um, uh, gotten advice from him, you know, all those sorts of things. And so when I found out that Alexander Chi was going to be at Bennington for my penultimate term, I knew I had to work with him. I was like, I'm dying to work with this person. Um, and Call Baby originally started as a short story and I, I don't write short stories. Um, I have been writing full length um, n n uh, fiction manuscripts, um, not only when I was in high school and college, but also when I was studying at Bennington. And I just wanted to experiment with the form. I was just like, you know what? Let me just experiment with the form. Let me just like see um, if I could do it. And I hated it because I remember I was the first one to be workshop. I didn't have a choice. I was like, oh. And I was the youngest one in the class. So I was really nervous. But I saw how drawn in people immediately were to this world. And when we had our one-on-one to discuss um, uh, my reading list, um, you know, cause I have to do creative annotations as well. He's like, I think this needs to be a novel. And he didn't tell me how to do it. He just said, he just gave me uh, recommendations for books to read. And I just started expanding. It was already 
um, my usual mode. I just wanted to try story stories to be different. He's like, no, I think it should be a novel. And it's funny because when I was doing the promotion for this, um, he said on Twitter, he was like, I, he's like, I tell, he's like very, like I tell people to turn things into novels, but very few have taken me up on that advice, like me. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, because if somebody like him says that, you, you might want to listen. <laughs> <laughs> at, at Pacific, that's often the, um, what's said about Ellen Bass, that if Ellen Bass gives you a piece of advice, you have to take it. That's- yeah, it's just like, why not? You know what I mean? I was like, why not? Um, so I want to talk a little bit or get you to think a little bit with us about um, something that you shared with us when you were in residency in mm-hmm. January. And I think most mm-hmm. of the people who are here with us tonight were either part of that or had or had an ability to see it. And when you were teaching with us in January, you spoke at length about recovering lost histories, the silences mm-hmm. of the archives, you call mm-hmm. it, and mm-hmm. of writing the what you called the marginalized self. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And though the novel isn't the writing of a self exactly, I think what's clear in the narrative is the ongoing threats, really the ongoing threats against marginalized people mm-hmm. and the possibility of these ongoing silences within the archives. Like there's mm-hmm. always that threat that, that these stories are gonna be lost. Mm-hmm. And there's this amazing moment which really popped out to me where, where there's a key event in the novel, and I won't mm-hmm. say what it is. Mm-hmm. There's a key event in the novel that gets described as you say, worthy of documentation in the studio museum or in the Schomburg. And these oh, are yeah, two cultural, yeah, 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 right? I'm thinking of that too, yep. Two cultural landmarks in Harlem, the Schomburg being the New York Public Library Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. So I see your, you know, I know, the, one of the things I know about you is your interest in this preservation. And then that idea pops into this novel, right? So. In thinking about these two themes that you brought to the community in the past, the this idea of writing the marginalized self and thinking about recovery from silenced archives, to what extent are these themes sort of woven into this novel? And how- Oh, that's a great question. And and in what ways are they central, as central to your fiction as they are to your nonfiction? Right, so that's a really good question. Um, So what I'll say is, is that um, the silence of the archive kind of comes in subtly or maybe overtly in this book because it's based in Harlem. And if you know anything about Harlem for the past several years, actually longer than that, it is rapidly gentrifying. Case in point, me and my partner, we were going on an outing like last week and we took an Uber uh, literally 20 blocks up and I stepped outside and I looked around a little bit disoriented and I was like, wait a minute, I lived on that block. If we take her, I lived in that block and actually that block is what inspired the Melon Song Brownstone. That's where I live. And I didn't even recognize it. And so for me, this har- this uh, this novel is my love letter to Harlem, but also it's, it's, a, it's a document for me to remember Harlem as I remember it because four years ago, I mean, because I lived in that spot four or five years ago and now it feels almost unrecognizable. And I realize how much Harlem is changing. And I think with the rising rent prices, the changing demographics of this historically and culturally rich place, what is gonna be lost when we replace that bodega with another artisanal bagel shop? What's gonna be lost? Like for example, the Langston Hughes Brownstone is now not a museum. It's not a, it's not an art center anymore. I think actually someone else bought it. Think about how much history is right then and there. Same thing with Maya Angelou's home right near Mount Lawrence Park. Um, it's not a museum. Museum, you know, but it's so it's like I think it's a private residence now. So what happens when you know people pass on, when people move in and others move out, and institutions change? And I think that's and especially with regards to Black history, it's already um, not as venerated as White American history. And so when we keep changing the landscapes of these very Black places, for lack of a better phrase. What happens to cultural memory? What happens to the, to that do- to those documents? Yeah. And the other, I mean, you talk now about writing a love letter to Harlem that in some way captures the past five years. Mm-hmm. But then this book goes back 20 years. Right, so because when I re- because when I realized, I said, okay, well, how how long has gentrification been happening? And I read that gentrification really started hitting the turbo gear in the late '90s. I didn't know that. I thought it was like 2000. I thought it was probably like 2010 to 2011. But no, it was like right around the time where the story starts in '98. That's when stuff started to happen suddenly, but it was it was happening. Yeah. 
and I heard, I've heard you talk with someone else um, in an interview, kind of like a fun, exciting Instagram live that I saw recently mm -hmm. um, of, of Harlem being this character in the novel. Mm -hmm. So not only a place to document, but even a character in and of mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. And I think what, what's most obvious to me as you're talking about it now, and as I was reading the book, was that this character, like all of the characters, is, is undergoing this transformation. And part of that um, is, as you're describing this sort of the rapid gentrification under the pressures basically of gentrification and whiteness. Like that's mm -hmm. what's sort of pressing down on Harlem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But there's a way in which Harlem as a character also, and maybe that's it's through the characters, but I, I just like for you to think, think with us a little bit mm -hmm. through this, is that there's a kind of, because you're sort of writing within this folklore tradition, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, uh, th there's a kind of inner life to Harlem in the same way that there's an inner life to these characters. And, th and there's a kind of self-awareness in mm -hmm. Harlem mm -hmm. that, I, that I feel here. And it's in some ways, probably the, the self-awareness that's contained in the narration. Mm -hmm. But in, in what ways did Harlem as a character and your characters' inner lives, like how, how, did, you, how did you think together about these two sort of characters, right? The character of the place and the characters of these individuals and the sort of self-awareness that motivates them. Well, yeah, well, I will say this, like, maybe it's because they're both mothers. Yeah. Harlem is a figurative mother. She has provided a home for people. She has given life in a sense for people and a community and her children, that being a community, want to protect her. She's also under attack. You know, she's very vulnerable. And I think that is what I think about. Maybe to me, like intuitively, Harlem is a black mother, just like Mama and Josephine and, um, you know, Amara, they're black mothers. And they're both very vulnerable to, you know, interlopers to the state. Um, and I think that that is what I wanted to do. And I think another thing is like Harlem is just so it's so palpably magical, if that makes sense. Like, you know, pre-pandemic, I mean, the sounds, albeit cacophonous, um, full of life, um, the smells, the textures, the type of people that are coming out, the food, the, the, you know, all of these things. It's like, you cannot come to Harlem and, and not be inspired by this place. So I knew that I wanted to be very particular with Harlem by naming certain uh, places and certain uh, street names because not only is because I want people to maybe perhaps do a literary tour someday by using my book, but also because of the fact that like when I'm, I moved to New York from uh, South Jersey, a very modest uh, suburban town. And what you know about suburbia is like, like appearance wise, it's, it's pretty monotonous. Everybody has the green lawns. The houses have the same stones. It's very much the same. Sound is delineated. It's always in your home. You have fences, gates to guard everything. With Harlem, it's just a huge melange of sounds and people and space. And so when I moved to Harlem, I had to. I, rem I realized that not only did I have to be mindful of time and space in a more acute manner because I was in a new place, but also for my own safety as a black woman um, at the time in 2015, there was so much conversation about street harassment. And when I first moved here, I was being street harassed. So I had to be way more aware of the, you know, just infinite stimuli that my body was interacting with every time I stepped out the door. Mm -hmm. And the, the Harlem in your novel has that, that feel, right? Mm -hmm. of, of real aliveness. Mm -hmm. You were talking before about Harlem as a black mother and all of these characters um, whose power in some ways comes out of black motherhood and who, and who are under attack because of being black mothers. I mean, that's, that's, that's the, the phrase that comes back uh, over and over in the novel is this sort of threat that black mothers are in. I can't quote mm -hmm. it exactly, but black mm -hmm. motherhood is, is mm -hmm. I forget what the phrase is, but it's, it is that. Mm -hmm. And as I was reading the novel and particularly one moment, um, I started to think about this other black mother who, who was under real attack over the course of her life. And so I, the story of Henrietta Lacks came to mind. Mm -hmm. And the woman who is, for the, for the audience who may not know, whose cervical cancer cells were taken without her knowledge mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or later developed into the first immortalized human cell, right? Or human mm -hmm. cell line. And Lacks, Henrietta Lacks, whose life and death led to many breakthroughs in medical research, mm -hmm. but whose family was not compensated in any way 
point mm -hmm, before mm -hmm. anything until recently. Mm -hmm. But I was reminded of this story when in Call Baby, a representative of the scientific community enters the story with the idea to profit off the regenerative cells of these black women. Yeah, yeah. And I wonder, as we're thinking about the, the archives, right, the silenced archives, the, the archives of black mothers and black people in this country in the, in the, in the, 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 the contributions, often in Henrietta Lack's case, unacknowledged for, for decades contributions. I wonder if Henrietta Lacks was in your mind at all as you were writing, or yeah. if not, what other stories, you know, in particular? Right, well, so, I mean, Henrietta Lacks was obviously, I mean, you were spot on, like Henrietta Lacks was obvious inspiration. I'm thinking about the enslaved black woman that Dr. Marion Sims experimented on without anesthesia during slavery and that, and he is considered the father of modern gynecology. We don't even know who those three, those enslaved black women are. They may have descendants right now. You know what I'm saying? So when I was thinking of the call and this business, I was a little worried about it because I was like, you know, I've never done magical realism, even though I, I love it in stories like with people flying in Song of Solomon, or ghosts and beloved, for example. But I was like, if this country has has profited off the degradation of black women's bodies, and even aside from slavery, this whole idea of black women saving us, whether it's turning Georgia blue, whether it's making sure that we have a democratic president, um, or whether it's just educating people, is it not that far-fetched that you would have people salivating to literally get pieces of black women's bodies to have a longer life or to be healed? And so, yeah, I definitely drew from those, those, those medical stories. Yeah. And it was really the entrance of that character um, who was, you know, ready to primed really to profit. That is just, it, that was Henry L. Actually came right to mind. Mm -hmm. I, I have two questions that I want to, ask you and then I'm going to ask anyone in the audience who has a question to please put it in the Q&A um, use the Q&A feature there for us and and the the first is about the aromas of the book because mm. there are aromas everywhere and then I want to get mm. to this question about the relationship of myth and reality yep, um, yep, yep. in magic in your story but let me ask first about um, about the aromas which are just to my mind overwhelming and really central to uh, what's happening here okay so in, in, an experience of reading the book is to be overwhelmed, as I'm saying, both good and bad with aromas. And these aromas mm -hmm. are often, as I was reading, indicative of character, mm -hmm. I think, or changes and transformation in the characters mm -hmm. and their surroundings that I don't want to describe fully because I might ruin something, right? If you mm. describe the change of smell of someone, you might, you might. Right. In the book. Right. But, but I, but it, it I, I'm interested in understanding um, what decisions you were making around this particular sensory experience, right? Given the prominence of smells and their particularity, there's oils, there's perfumes, there's foul dairy, right? There's mildew and sourness of all kinds throughout this book. Mm -hmm. I wonder how much this was mapped out by you before you Oh, yeah. <laughs> or whether certain smells aligned with certain ideas or characters. How, how did you think about smell? Man, these are such good questions. So I knew that like I love sensory details. So if you have a lot of times when the family comes together, you'll see there's tea, there's some type of food on the table because that's so much I feel like what, in my personal life when it comes to black women I'm talking, that constitutes communion too, is the food and the beverage you pass around. Now with regards to smell, um, I love smells. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? I feel like I think about I don't know. It's funny because I'm hoping now that maybe 20, 30 years from now, I will read scholarship on this book and it's like smells pertain to characters. But it's like, <laughs> I think about, you know, if you read about how Josephine seduces Landon, who's her, who's her lover, there's certain smells in there that are considered to be aphrodisiac. What I'm thinking about how there's a, there's a haunting in this brownstone, like dead and stale, for example. Um, but I also think, I mean, you got me thinking about my own mother. One of the reasons why I love lavender um, as a scent, as a salve, as an oil is because it reminds me of my mother. When I was growing up, my mother would have lavender candles. 
um, she would have all types of stuff in the bathrooms and in the bedrooms. And, and so, yeah, now, I mean, maybe, I mean, subconsciously, I wasn't thinking about it, but I was like, I want there to be an aroma in the air because so often I don't really, he I don't really read about smell in a book unless it's a, a an offensive one. Mm -hmm. So I wanted there to be definitely just like this world of enchanting aromas um, that actually leads into like, I don't know, I wouldn't say bewitching, but like kind of leads to this sort of like magical family. Like that's a part of the allure too. Yeah, right. And, and it isn't ever, I mean, you were describing before about your, about your creation of these characters who on the one hand were gonna be, you know, sort of villainous. And on the other hand, we're gonna be not villainous because you love villains and, you know, they were gonna be round, full, realized, complicated, complex characters. Mm -hmm. And those, and that characterization, at least in my reading, and maybe 20 or 30 years from now, God willing, um, I'll write that essay because it's, okay. it's, you know, because it's there, like these characters are, are layered with their, and known by their aroma. You know, when Landon arrives to kiss Josephine, if she knows whether whether he's been with his wife because he does or does not taste or smell like her. And that's the sort of really- Yeah, like, yeah. You know, and, and it's consistent through the book. I mean, you you know, you just sort of have, have developed these characters in that way, in the way that they both smell and mm -hmm. look and sound certain ways, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the other thing that I was thinking about in terms of sensory stuff, um, has to do with the, the kind of like repetitive, and I don't know whether you sort of think about this from the novel, but the ways in which there's certain sounds that get repeated um, by the house. Like the house has a character because it makes a sort of rat tat tat sound or something mm -hmm. like that. There's a mm -hmm. kind of scratching. Yeah, because I'm trying to tell people, pay attention to this. Like this yeah. is a, this, and it's like, it's, it reminds me of like when you watch TV shows and there's like what they call like Easter eggs. It's like, yeah. I'm trying to tell you like in the midst of all this family drama, pay attention to the subtleties in, this, in the brownstone right. because it's going to have a huge climactic finish at, you know, at the end. And that's something that, you know, we can get from watching television, but it's also something that you learn from working with mentors and working with teachers and listening to webinars like this one, that there's a way to, to develop a sense of suspense and, and, a, and a, a way of understanding what's coming based on things like a sensory detail and mm -hmm. so on, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's, yeah, I, again, I won't give, I won't give away another important smell. No, it's okay. um, my wife is a literary agent and she often think when thinking, she's thinking about her books, she'll often say that every book is a mystery. It doesn't matter what kind of book you're writing. Every book is a mystery because they're trying to get you to get to the next thing, to understand the next detail, the next moment of the story. And you've just yep. described a non mystery. This is, doesn't, I don't think this is a, a mystery. It's sort of a family drama in certain ways with mysterious, with mysterious elements. Mm -hmm. Um, but it does leave you, it does lead you to wonder what's coming next through these kind of the details you're describing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. So you've talked a little bit about the line that this novel walks between myth and reality. Mm -hmm. And this is an idea that you refer to directly as the book comes to, to the close. Like that's a phrase that you use, that this, that there's that there's this tension here between myth and reality. But it is a feature that sort of exists throughout the book. This, you know, you sort of mm -hmm referred possibly to this play in magical real, realism, which is, mm -hmm. which is sort of there. Now, sometimes this interplay is part of the plot or the details. There are things that happen that seem like maybe they shouldn't be able to happen or there's like the room is alive in some way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and if you wanna talk about that, that's great. But there, there's one detail that I'm really interested in and mm -hmm. this comes from the, the, the place of narration, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There's a moment in the book where a mythical thing to my mind happens. The character who I referred to before, Iris, heals in a moment at a funeral she just she just heals. oh yeah that, right? yeah you yeah. know this moment and it's a few and, and i'm not giving anything away to say that iris can heal herself or is healed just sort mm -hmm. of naturally and what happens in this moment is the narration itself is in my reading of it at least takes on itself a myth a mythical quality the writing itself sounds like a written account of an oral tradition maybe a written account of folklore ah. and if you'll if you'll indulge me here i'm going to quote you a little bit if you'll indulge okay me. okay because this doesn't sound like the rest of the narration to me. This sounds different and special. So listen, I mean, I think. Okay. It says, okay. You say, the funeral attendees left saying they saw the marks vanish with their own eyes. 
Others would say the lighting was bad in certain parts of the church and they couldn't see a thing. Many would not speak of what they had and had not seen. Now, when I read that, the writing seems to be beyond the story itself. Mm. Not just storytelling about what's happening, but it's as if there was a narrator beyond the narrator mm. that we've come to know so far. Wow. Do you, how, what happened there? How, what, what made you decide that you were gonna become a myth writer? I mean, it sounds like kind of biblical. Oh, you know, thanks. like New well, Testament stuff. Well, you thank know? you. I mean, well, the thing is, um, is a part of surrendering for me because I try to have so much control over the narrator. Oh, the narrative, excuse me, that I had to realize that like black people and the black people I grew up around, they're, they're all, they're such great storytellers to begin with. And so for me, it was like, imagine if you saw the scene that preceded what you wrote, right? Excuse yeah. me, what you read. It's like, did it happen? Did it happen? Because the thing about it with these women, the Melanson family is that they divide Harlem. There are people that don't want to believe in what they have and other people do believe in it, but they still think that something is off with these women. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, it, it, I, I wanted that I wanted that part of the story to leave an opening for other iterations of what happened that day that I can't say. Mm -hmm. So I tried to think about imagine you had a funeral where everything comes to a head emotionally and people are dispersing into their respective homes and they tell about what happened and the only way they know how to tell it. And it takes on other meanings and life forms. So that's why I wrote it in that way. It sounds a little bit like um, that opening that you were describing, that your friends describe you as, as having this sort of openness to grace, you know, that, that you, you don't need to be in control mm -hmm. of everything. That, that you need to be open to, um, well, the magic of, the, of storytelling itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so Morgan, Morgan and I can talk um, on our own for, you know, 10 or 12 more minutes if, if you'd like, but, but you're here gathered with us. So let's see if you have some questions. Yeah, here we go. Um, so an anonymous attendee. Um, you mentioned, Morgan, you can probably see these, but I'll read them so mm -hmm, everyone can mm -hmm. hear them. Um, so you mentioned that magic was new for you. And so how did you find the magic for yourself? Well, I will say this, like I was inspired to write about the call because I actually have an aunt who was very perceptive when it comes to people. And my mother actually said to me, like, it, you know, it's a rumor that she was born with a veil. That's number one. Number two is that, you know, when I was doing, uh, field work for my second book, Water and Exchange Lands, which was about my family's place in the Great Migration. Um, and I did a lot of field work. And like, I, I would say in the vein of Sora No Hurston, where I was going to different parts of the country and trying to forge dialogue between those who fled their ancestral lands versus those who remained. And when I went to the low country um, in South Carolina and I spoke to Gullah Geechee people down there, um, they there's this famous, famous root doctor. His name is Dr. Buzzard. Um, and it was a rumor, somebody told me that it was a rumor that he was born with a call. So that's how I found um, the magic for myself was looking at my family and looking at the communal traditions and the people that I've studied um, for a previous book. Hmm. I just put in the chat uh, a, um, a link oh. to the Zora Neale Hurston book, Mules and Men, which yeah. I think captures what you're describing. Yeah. Um, there's a question in the chat about the cover and, and how the story itself is, is saying the, the Harlem Renaissance or rebirth artist, Romare Bearden's artwork is beautifully paired here uh, with your novel. Um, is, can you talk with us about how this came to be? Yeah, I didn't decide that. My art team was like, what do you think about this? This is a Romare Bearden artwork. And I wasn't that familiar with this work, I'll admit. Um, when I looked up his work, I was like, oh, wow, you know, he was a part of the Harlem Renaissance and his mother was actually born in Atlantic City, New Jersey, just like my mother. Mm -hmm. So it was definitely a full circle moment that not even the art team knew, I told them, but they were the ones, my art team, I will say at Harper, they're very astute. Um, and they were the ones that chose th this cover. Oh, great. 
and presumably you said that looks great. <laughs> yes, I love it. It was it was an enthusiastic uh, praise from both myself and my agent. Yeah, yeah, it's really it's really beautiful. Um, so someone someone here is asking, saying first thanks for the great talk, and I um, as we sort of get close to the time, Morgan, I'll thank you as well. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And uh, Maureen Boyd, one of our uh, students in the program, is wondering about your process and how mm -hmm. long did it take you to write Call Baby, maybe or the original story sort of in, with Alexander Chi, and to think with us about the revision process and, and at what point do you know when you're done? So I wrote Call Baby as a short story. I probably wrote it probably over the course of a few weeks. It, and granted, it was 20 pages. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like a full length novel. Now, Call Baby... I have been writing Call Baby off and on for about five, well, I will say it's been six years in the making, but I finished up the visions on Call Baby last year, so I'll say five years, um, off and on for five years. Um, the revision process was interesting because I knew that my publisher wanted me to be on a specific timeline um, for this book. And um, they really wanted me to get some help with revising it, with just like fleshing out more of Mama's character or figuring out the motivation for this and figuring out how the first and the second parts of this book were gonna connect. And what I did was I actually enlisted a beta reader. One of my friends, um, their name is Dennis Norris II. And um, they actually, they, they do work at the Rumpus um, they did work at Tent House and they were the ones who helped me to like put it together. Now I was under, a very strict deadline. I had to turn around revision in like a month or a month and a half. And it was interesting because that was last June. And what happened last June is with Harlem, it, it uh, had this explosion of sounds after this sort of post-apocalyptic silence that came with us being the epicenter of the virus. Um, and so all of these sounds, the textures, everything came out, not only because people were socially distancing in the park, but also because of the George Floyd protests. So what I did was I leaned into that sound. My revision process was me writing no later than 7.30 in the morning and revising for maybe three, three and a half hours at most. That's all I would do. I, I'm not a person that writes all day long. I just refuse to do it. How did I know I was done? The simple question is just my age is like, okay, you can move on to copy edit. <laughs> when, 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 when you go, when you are a, um, an agent and author with a publishing house and they say that your book, it can go on to copy edit, that means that not only is your book going on to production, but that also means you're going to get your check soon. So that's why I also wanted to finish. <laughs> um, it, <laughs> would you say there's a similar process um, with writing the nonfiction books too? That you oh, or like, you know, I'm done? Uh, well, here's the thing, like, with this will be my doing, it was, I will say it was the least rigorous book because it was a lot of personal essays. Yeah, I had some like uh, secondary sources in there, but 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 nowhere near compared to Water and Strange Lands where like the bibliographic resources were in the hundreds, you know, and I had to deal with audio recordings, transcriptions, fact checking, legal, all of these different things. So, um, that was that part. When it came to fiction, it was rigorous in a sense that I had to remember the world that I built. What I mean by that is like knowing that a call has magical properties. What are the properties? What are the restraints? What are the limits of that? And, and sticking to it. So even when my book went on the copy, the copy editors were like, hey, you just said this in, in 56 that contradicted or undermined what you just established on page 11. Um, so that was something that I had to keep in mind too. Yeah, I was answering a question for someone on the faculty today about copy editing, and I went back to something of mine that had recently, that had, I guess five years ago been copy edited, and I just saw the, the power of that work. Like, we, we need copy editors so badly. <laughs> oh, yeah, because they were catching things that I would have never, yeah. never gotten. Yeah. yeah. What, what was the, um, of the, of the powers that you created, of the magic that you created, what was the one in this book that you think was sort of most uh, surprising to yourself that just in terms of like expanding your own imagination, like, you know, you didn't know before you started writing this book that you could, it doesn't even have to be the magic, but what did you learn from writing this book that you didn't know you could do before? I love that I, I you know, I think it's just being a maximalist mm -hmm. with language. I am a maximalist with language. I just am. 
And I think part of the reason why is because the first book I ever really loved was Madame Bovary. And if you read Flaubert, Flaubert is, is excessive of, in terms of prose. Um, and I also love the leader as controversial as it is. I love the leader and Nabokov, even though he is not a native English speaker, like he's one of the few artists I feel like that really can play with the English language, like very few authors can. And I wanted to be a maximalist with this book because again, I feel like black women, like I owe them, we owe them so much. And I wanted them to be so expansive, not only in terms of their powers, but just psychologically in this book. I also, you know, I was just really proud of myself with writing the brownstone in the way that I did because I actually hate writing descriptions about spaces. Like in the past, it used to be, there's a table here, there's a bookshelf here. I, I don't like going into detail about rooms. I just don't because I'm just not good at it. And I guess maybe it's laziness. So I was really glad that I was able to provide a sustained portrait of this brownstone in the midst of all the other things that was going on. Well, the thing that, the thing that, that what you were just saying about, about what one owes to the people who came before us and what you feel you might owe to these women and these black women in particular, I think is, I was going to say that was a great place to end, but um, which it would have been a great place to end. But I also want to comment quickly on, on, on the, what you were able to do with the brownstone. To mm -hmm. my mind, um, and it just gets you to have a, maybe a final thought before we wrap okay. up. But you, I didn't feel that you treated the black brownstone as a, as a static place. And maybe that's what allowed you to really go with it. Because it was yeah. a place that, that was as much, I was thinking before about Harlem as a character and your individuals as characters. Mm -hmm. There's something about the house is possessed by character. Yes. And it's yep. possessed by a monster, you know. It's haunted. Yeah. So, so, so just talk for maybe just one final thought before we wrap up tonight about how you turn a static place into a haunted living place that ages with the rest of the story. Well, I feel like for me, it's like these women temper fate. Mm -hmm. And these women have a lot of baggage, spiritual baggage of what they're doing with people and what people are doing to them. Um, and you can't have that type of heaviness and it not be congested somewhere. So if it's not gonna be congested in their bodies because they're physically impervious for the most part, it's gonna be in the energy that they carry in this house. And so that's why the house was a, such a spiritual living place because they're so desperate. They have imbued so much of their energy into it already. And just the people's lives that that they're you know that they're being involved in through the selling of their own bodies, it's almost kind of like their spiritual comeuppance in a way, um, with this house. Where it's like, okay, well, you want to like you know you're gonna you're gonna it's almost like a thing where I said when you hold on to something so tightly it crumbles when you let go. It's kind of like that with the brownstone. Um, where this house is is considered to be so macklin is indicative of their wealth and is indicative of their legacy but it's holding so much, it, it, it's, just, it's just a reservoir for the good and the bad. Oh, that's a perfect image to end on, the sort of crumbling in the hand is anyone who reads the book will know what's held in the hand at the end of the book is uh, very important indeed. <laughs> Morgan, it was so great to spend this hour with you. Um, Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for writing this book. Thanks for joining us to talk about it. And I'm gonna let people say some nice things in the chat here as we as we sign out. But um, but Morgan, it was great to talk with you and enjoy Bye the rest guys. of your night and thanks for coming out. Thank you. All right, take care everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.